Hello everyone, I hope you're doing well. Um, today's lesson will be a continuation for the first part that I made about ancient Britain. I'm going to start with the Anglo-Saxons and I will stop with Edward I. I hope you find it useful. Thank you for watching. Enjoy! So starting with the Anglo-Saxons, um, why they came to Britain? Historians have two reasons. The first one is that their land often flooded and they couldn't grow corns easily, so they needed a new land. The second reason is that they were invited to England for keeping invaders from Scotland out of England. Most of them were farmers and in the course of the 6th century, seven separate Anglo-Saxon kingdoms grew up. We have small kingdoms of East Anglia, Kent, Essex, Sussex. The strong powers were Northumbria, Mercia and Wessex. These three dominated English politics. Until the 9th century after the Viking conquest, Wessex remained the only Anglo-Saxon kingdom. Concerning religion, they were pagans until 597 where Pope Gregory sent St. Augustine to England to re-establish Christianity. They did not fight back much and they turned uh, to Christianity also. Concerning the Vikings, they were Norsemen, Swedes and Danes. They were highly skilled with sailing and fighting and were preoccupied with piracy. Between 865 and 870, the Vikings destroyed Northumbria and Mercia. However, Wessex in the south had more resisting power thanks to its ruler, King Alfred. But on 878, they were overrun by an unexpected attack by the Danes. Alfred managed to reverse the situation and made a treaty uh, with the enemy that was called Wedmore. They agreed to retire to the Danelaw which was former Northumbria, Mercia, East Anglia, leaving Wessex free. King Alfred was a very successful king. He built fortresses, established a fleet, a navy, he translated books from Latin to Anglo-Saxon, which was Old English. By 937, the Dane law had been reconquered from the Danes by King Alfred's son, Edward. Moving forward until 1016, where the king at the time was Ethelred, he died and there was a struggle to the throne between a Dane, who was called Cannot, and Edmund Ironside, uh, Elfred's son. When Edmund died, the Wittens, who were an institution made by the Anglo-Saxons, who advised the king of matters and uh, he chose to ask their opinion. So they chose Cannot and he proved to be a mighty king. He had control over the whole of Britain and Scandinavia, but unfortunately he soon after died and the empire broke up under his successors. In 1043, Edward the Confessor, one of Eth uh, Ethelred's sons, became the king of England. He was named Confessor because he was interested with church much more than kingship. He brought a lot of Normans, introducing them to high positions of church and state. Because with his Normans, he could resist one of the powerful noblemen at the time in Wessex, who was Earl Godwin. In 1066, Edward died with no obvious heir, so claimants for the throne rose two claimants for the throne. The first one was Godwin's son, Harold Godwinson. Their names are a bit alike, so bear with me. Since his claim was that since he was the son of the most powerful man, he should take the throne. The second claim was with Duke William of Normandy, saying that I am his cousin and he told me that I can take the kingship after he dies. They say in 1066, dying Edward named Harold his heir, and the Wittens chose him. So William took immediate decision to invade England. King Harold faced two threats. The first one was William of Normandy, and the second one was Harold Hardada, the Viking monarch. Vikings landed in the north of England. Harold Godwinson had to march there to fight them. He won the fight in the Stanford battle and defeated the Viking army. At the same time, he had to march back to, uh, south to fight with William of Normandy, yet he was defeated and killed in the Battle of Hastings, which made William take over England and he was known as William the Conqueror. During his reign, he started using the feudal system. It is when the king gives land to his nobles, then takes part from it. This chain continued until it reached the peasants. 
Each class controlled the one beneath it under the saying, every man has a lord and every lord has a land. And to know exactly who owned which piece of land and how much it was worth, he sent a team of people all through England to make a complete economic survey. It was known as the Doomsday Book and made people pay taxes on how much they owned. William had control over both England and Normandy. He had three sons, Rufus, William, Henry. When he died, uh, Robert became the Duke of Normandy and William Rufus took England. There were quarrels between the sons. When William died in a hunting accident and Henry came to the throne, a struggle started between the two. It ended when Henry united Normandy and England under his rule and imprisoned his brother for the rest of his life. Henry's son died, so he accepted for his daughter, Matilda, to succeed him. However, when, she, uh, when he died, I'm sorry, she was away with her husband, Geoffrey Plantagenet, so Henry's nephew, Stéphane de Blois, named himself King. A fierce war started between the two and ended with an agreement that when Stephen dies, her own son would take over the crown. He died a year later and a new generation started with the Plantagenet. Henry II had a great empire. He did not just own England and Normandy, but he also inherited Anjou from his father and gained French Aquitaine from his wife. However, during his reign, there was, a, there was a bitter struggle between the church and the state. This resulted in the murder of the priest Thomas Becket and Henry became a cursed man. He was followed by his son Richard I, who was known as the Lionheart, one of the most popular kings of England, brave and a good soldier. He went to the Holy Land to go to war against the Muslims. When he died, he was followed by his brother, John. Reigns, uh, John's reign was a series of disasters. In 1204, Normandy was lost. He made problems with the church that led them to place England under an interdict from 1208 to 1214. He made people pay a lot of taxes, so the nobility, the merchants and the town holders were getting tired of paying these high taxes. As a result, most of powerful sections of English society formed a coalition against King John and forced him to sign their Great Charter, which was known as the Magna Carta, and that was meant to the king he had to follow the same rules as his subjects, and his claim of having absolute power by God was eliminated. Henry III came to the crown when he was only 9 years old. He was the son of John Lackland. However, he was tied with the Magna Carta, therefore he couldn't rule until he became 25. Until 1225, he took control and wanted to govern without depending on anybody. He had a French wife, therefore her relatives held high offices. The husband of Henry's sister was called Simon de Montfort, he was also French. The last rebelled against the king and he imprisoned him in 1264. During the year of 1258, it saw the beginnings of Parliament with Simon de Montfort, where meetings were to be held with the presence of barons and churchmen as well as two knights and townsmen from every shire to talk and discuss. Simon was killed, however, by Edward I, he was Henry's son, and in his reign he needed money to run the government, so he called groups of men from various parts of the country as representatives in the Great Council, which was known as Model Parliament, in which various classes were present. The knights and townsmen became known as the House of Commons, while barons and churchmen became known as House of Lords. That was it for today's video, I hope you found it useful. I could not mention everything, as I said before, I can't do that in just one video. Um, I apologize if I mispronounce the names of the, the figures in the video. If you found it useful, please tell me. If you have any questions, I'm here to help. I'm here to answer all of them. Thank you for watching. Have a nice time.